The fourth-ranked Ohio State Buckeyes will take on the third-ranked Penn State Nittany Lions. Ohio State is about a three, three-and-a-half, four-point favorite. The total is just under 49, so somewhere in the vicinity of 48, 48-and-a-half, 47-and-a-half, around there. All right, Saturday, noon Eastern time on Fox. This will be the 18th top-five matchup all time for the Nittany Lions, their record in those matchups is 6-10-1 and one in the 17 leading up. Their last win in a top five matchup came in 1999. That was against Arizona. So a big opportunity for James Franklin and an enormous opportunity for Penn State. Let's start with question number one. Who will get the go at quarterback for Penn State? Now, Drew Aller, he injured his left knee in the second quarter against Wisconsin. He's been said at this point to be a quote, game time decision, uh, which wouldn't, shouldn't everybody be a game time decision? <laughs> I mean, we always use these designations and whether a guy can go or not go, like, isn't it kind of always at the buzzer, like how a guy is feeling, whether or not he can go? Like if I come down with stomach bug, does that make me a game time decision? That absolutely does. So game time decision right now for Aller because of the knee, but I do think, let's just be honest, I think he's probably going to go, but we'll see. All right, we'll see. If he can't, Bo Pribula, who did a really good job in the second half of the football game last week. I mean, went in, was efficient throwing the football. He's always been a gadget player, a guy that's been used within the offense, but now not just in that little package. They're now using him kind of in the entire offense. And I thought he threw the ball pretty well. Now, these two guys, depending on who's under center or in shotgun for the Nittany Lions, the offense changes drastically. When it's Aller, it's a little more predictable. I think he's underrated from a mobility standpoint, but Privula is really a runner that has now developed into becoming a pretty good passer. Whereas Aller is more of a passer that can keep you honest at times with his legs. The good news for Penn State is that their offensive coordinator, Andy Kotelnicki, who they paid the big bucks to to bring him over from Kansas, he's gone through this before. This is not new for Andy Kotelnicki. And if you remember what Kansas has gone through the last couple of years from a quarterback standpoint, they've had challenges with keeping guys healthy, with guys in and out of the lineup. You think a guy's going to go, and then boom, he can't at the last minute. For instance, last year at Kansas, Andy Kotelnicki and company, they prepped all week leading into their game against Texas, their biggest game on the schedule, at least up to that point. Biggest game of the week for them. Jalen Daniels was their starting quarterback, and then boom, in warm-ups or in the pregame, Jalen Daniels hurts his back. Well, hey, in goes Jason B. They also kind of sat there wondering all season long if Jalen Daniels would be able to return. So Jason Bean was kind of left in limbo and didn't really know week to week if he was going to have to play, start, play in a role, play situationally, what have you. So this is not new for Andy Kotelnicki. And I think his experience having gone through what he went through last year at Kansas will better prepare him and the offense to succeed this weekend. Like I said, I anticipate Drew Aller playing. Uh, I, I think it's likely. Um, and at the end of the day, does it matter? That's the real question. Does it matter? Because the athletic component that Pribula brings to the table could be pretty interesting in this matchup. Either way, I think Penn State is in good hands at the quarterback position. Would rather have the experience of Aller for sure, but the athleticism of Pribula does make things a little bit different for how Ohio State's defense might approach the game. Question number two, can Penn State get off to a fast start? Now, they've scored 24 first quarter points. Uh, they haven't scored very many, however, in the last few weeks. It's a little bit of a feeling out process, especially in a game like this. We know the home field advantage in a game like this is massive. Okay, It's a little better when it's not at noon. Uh, if this game were at night in the traditional whiteout game, people would be literally jumping out of the stands. It'd be absolutely outrageously insane. A noon game, I do think, helps the away team just a little bit because you kind of just wake up and you go and it doesn't allow the fans in the stands to kind of work themselves into a frenzy over the course of a 12 game pregame right the fans will be will be well hydrated but maybe not as hydrated if the game kicked off at 6 30 
not because they won't try. It's because you just don't have that much time. All right. You catch my drift there. You catching my drift. I've done a whiteout game. It's something. All right. It's awesome. It's a great experience. I wish this game was a whiteout, but it is what it is. All right. However, I got down a rabbit hole there. I apologize. Let's get back to the actual ball. All right. If you look at the first quarter of football games for Penn State, there is this conservative approach offensively that is a little bit unique. They basically look at it and they say, we don't want to lose the game in the first quarter. Let's just kind of feel it out. Let's see how teams are playing us defensively, and let's just work our way into the plan. You know how many downfield throws they've attempted in the first quarter of this season? And we qualify downfield throws as throws that travel 20 plus yards. You know how many they've tried? Zero. Zero. Downfield throws attempted by Penn State in the first quarter of their seven football games this season. Now, after the first quarter, the whole world opens up and they start to get aggressive and they start to become a little bit more willing to take chances. So I think against Ohio State, especially with the crowd behind you, it's imperative for Penn State to get off to a really fast start because if Ohio State starts fast, you know what Penn State's going to be thinking? Oh, here we go again. Question number three, can Ohio State get their offensive line figured out? Now, throughout the offseason, there has been so much talk about Ohio State's roster and their ability to attract premier players, whether it be by way of the portal or high school recruiting ranks. I think you look at their roster from top to bottom, you could make a case to the strongest roster in the United States. You could. Uh, maybe if you exclude NFL teams, which and there might even be, you know, the Panthers. I'm not sure they have as much talent as the Ohio State Buckeyes, but I digress, all right? Looking at what they've done from a roster standpoint, every position group is just lights out as far as guys that will eventually play on Sundays. Now, will some become pro bowlers, all pros? I don't know, but they got a lot of pros on that roster. Their starting 22 is littered with future pros. The one area, though, that's a significant problem is the offensive line. And if you look at their offensive line recruiting, just two high school offensive linemen that they've recruited that ranked in the top 100 nationally. Both those players, Donovan Jackson, their left guard, might be left tackle this year, and Tegra Shabola, those guys are both starting for Ohio State, but neither have kind of lived up to the top 100 billing so far. Made one addition in the transfer portal. That was the center from Alabama, Seth McLaughlin. When they lost their left tackle against Oregon, that was Josh Simmons, the backup situation was a problem. They go to Zen Mahalski, a guy that been playing college for four years but hadn't really played much on the offensive line. Well, he clearly wasn't the answer. Gave up a couple sacks, gave up a couple pressures. He gets hurt in the fourth quarter. When Mahalski left the game, they moved their left guard to left tackle. And then you stick sophomore Luke Montgomery in there at left guard. Well, I don't know what they're going to go with as far as their starting lineup. All I know is whoever's in there better be ready to play against a high caliber group along the defensive line because we know Abdul Carter, we know who he is, and we better know where he's at at all times. And if I'm Penn State and I'm looking at this Ohio State offensive line, Abdul Carter's working the left tackle all game long. And then if Deny Dennis Sutton can go, then it makes things even more difficult to be able to block this group. All right, question number four. If Ohio State can't run the ball, can Will Howard win the game? Uh, they had just 141 rushing yards against the Ducks. They could not move the ball very well against Nebraska. Uh, season low, 64 rushing yards between uh, Judkins and Travion Henderson. Uh, not what you're looking for. All right, 20 carries to account for just two plus yards per carry. Not good enough. Now, Quinchon Judkins did catch a touchdown, but the running game has not been great. And they're going against a great group. Penn State's eighth against the run. They allow 93 yards a game. They're 13th in yards per carry. This is a really good group against the run. And Will Howard's been good this year. And to be honest with you, I think he's a touch underrated. He's fifth in EPA per drop back. And two of the four in front of him play at the academies in Bryson Daly and Blake Horvath. So they don't drop back quite as often. The other two that are in front of him are Curtis Rourke at Indiana, who's playing out of his mind, and the Heisman frontrunner Cam Ward. So I think Will Howard's really underrated. And last week, 
he was pretty dang efficient. 81% of his passes, 221 and three touchdowns, did have a bad pick on the overthrow, and they have elite weapons as well. And Jeremiah Smith, he could be the key to breaking this game open. Because if you look at how Ohio State has played against Penn State the last two years, guess who took that game over? That was Marvin Harrison. In 2022 and 2023, Marvin Harrison had 21 catches for 347 and a touchdown. Double-digit catches in both games. It's the only two times he ever went in double digits in his Ohio State career. And 19 of his 21 catches against Penn State resulted in either a first down or a touchdown. So Ohio State has had that receiver take the game over. Maybe this year it's Jeremiah Smith. And then finally, Jim Knowles, will he begin to ramp up the variety that he was always famous for, right? Ohio State has constantly said that they need their front four to bring pressure. But if you look last week, Ohio State had three sacks in the game. All three came when Jim Knowles decided to ramp up the pressures. Now, they've put this pass rush package on the field multiple times. And guys, it's just not very effective. JT Tui Molaau and Jack Sawyer are great run defenders. I think they're okay rushing the passer. They're not crazy twitchy. And then Caden Curry and Kenyatta Jackson on the inside. Like this, this is not a very effective pass rushing unit. I just look at kind of where things are and I look at how Jim Knowles has kind of made his name in the sport. And he's looking at his roster saying, man, I got great players here. Like I might not have to do as much because I got great players that can create their own shot in the pass rush. Well, it hasn't been super effective. So maybe he needs to ramp things up pressure wise. Well, guess what? Against Nebraska, the blitz rate was 49%. That was nearly double what they did against Oregon the week before. They were 25% against Oregon. When you remove the Nebraska game, their blitz rate this season was 22%. Last year, it was 22. And in 2022, it was 24. So we'll see if they decide to ramp that pressure up again this week against an offensive line that I think is pretty solid and a group that I do think can create some question marks. There's so many different tenants. I could spend an hour breaking this game down, by the way. Like I haven't even talked hardly at all about Penn State's passing attack and whether or not they can take advantage of a questionable secondary because I don't know who the quarterback's going to be. But I do know this. I know when I watch that Oregon tape, I look at them going after Denzel Burke, Davidson Igbenosin, and I look, they kind of find some success. Now, things looked a little better against Nebraska. But that was because Nebraska ran like 70 million screens throughout the game. It was all horizontal. So uh, Igbenosin had a few penalties in the game, by the way, too. So I didn't even break that down because I just don't know who's going to be playing quarterback for the Nittany Lions. So that's a question that I wish we could address. We just won't have time because we just won't know until that game kicks off. A couple trends in the game. Over the last five years, AP top five teams as home dogs are 3-0 and against the spread. They're also 3-0 and outright. Penn State is 7-3 and three against the spread against Ohio State under James Franklin. However, he is 1-9 and nine straight up. I'm taking the bait. It doesn't feel good. It doesn't feel good at all. I think this is going to be a super low-scoring affair. I think it's going to be a Big Ten clash where physicality is of the utmost importance, where line of scrimmage play determines who wins and loses. And right now... I think there's a decided advantage along the line of scrimmage in favor of Penn State. I'm taking Penn State. And like I said, it feels terrible to say those words out loud, and I'll probably be eating some crow come Sunday, but I got to go with what I've seen so far. And right now, Ohio State's offensive line is just too big of a concern for me to overlook.